The project that we're speaking about today is an expansion of an existing wastewater treatment plant from 32 million gallons per day to uh, 38 million gallons per day and adding um, uh, MBRs, um, mem membrane bioreactors to, to the process to uh, create the situation there. And uh, the project has recently been approved for its construction phase with a construction value in the neighborhood of $300 million. And interestingly, our uh, price proposal for the construction phase was submitted to Pavel, I can't remember the exact date, something like March 18th. And we all have those middle March dates blazed on our memory for a lot of reasons. In Boston, the biggest problem was they had to cancel the St. Patrick's Day uh, festivities. Uh, but we know it's gone downhill from there. And uh, point being here that uh, we were successful in negotiating with the uh, county, uh, the construction phase activities, even with uh, social distancing and, and the protocols that were, were in place. So uh, even with the pandemic raging in, in April, uh, the team forged ahead and, and kept the project on track and negotiated through the, uh, through the difficulties of, of getting the construction. Uh, price. So let me introduce the uh, the speakers now. Uh, we're fortunate to have uh, David Clark, who's the director of public works uh, for Fulton County. David's been with the county uh, a little bit over five years. And uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with Fulton County, uh, it's the um, uh, county where uh, the city of Atlanta is seated. Um, and the population is about a million, which makes it better than a quarter of the population of the state of Georgia, about uh, 570 square miles of, of uh, territory. So quite a bit of responsibility for David to deal with, with that, uh, that set of challenges that comes with, um, with uh, a big uh, population such as that. And a fun fact that you can share with your family and friends or maybe stump the stars on trivia night, uh, Fulton County was uh, named in honor of Robert Fulton. Who was Robert Fulton? He was the inventor and builder of the first commercially viable steamboat, which we know uh, was an important part of America's industrial revolution in the 19th century, particularly in, in the South. Um, so that's a little bit about uh, Fulton, Fulton County. David, of course, is a uh, degree professional engineer and licensed professional engineer, spent much of his time in the transportation sector and uh, now broadened his uh, background into the uh, into the water area as well, but this this project and others under his responsibility. Uh, Pavel uh, Mayfield is the project's uh, project manager. Uh, uh, Pavel is also a degreed civil engineer. Uh, been with uh, Archer Western. Archer Western is the uh, part of the Walsh Group, as you may know. <clears throat> and uh, Pavel's been with Archer Western for most of his career, almost 20 years now, and uh, started out. Uh, in the field, uh, from a bottom-up Horatio Alger sort of situation, and now I'm managing major projects for Archer Western. And you know, one of the fun parts of uh, being uh, involved in a project like this, I'm the officer in charge and executive committee member of our joint venture with Archer Western, uh, is to get to know the people. And um, I'm going to take some credit for this. Brown and Collins is going to take some credit for this. Since we've known Pavel, which is about three years. His son, for three years running now, has been the state champion in, in gymnastics. So I think it was when the joint venture came together that, that, that uh, success started. It wasn't a problem. But anyway, congratulations to you on, uh, on, on that. And last, uh, Kelly Comstock is Brown Caldwell's uh, project manager. He's the deputy project manager for this project. He and Pavel have worked closely together for the last three years on every element of the project. He's also the project design manager and pre-construction manager, which is a critically important part of the design build project where everything comes together between the design and, and construction. Uh, Kelly's a Georgia Tech grad, a licensed professional engineer, and soon to be a DBIA certified design build. Uh, professional. So with those introductory comments, let's get to the meat of the matter. And I think David Clark is going to uh, go a little deeper on the project. Thanks, yep. David. <clears throat> Thank you, Steve. Good morning, everybody. Again, I'm David Clark. I'm the director of public works here in Fulton County. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about um, the, uh, the procurement side of things of our Big Creek project. But just first, just to lay out some groundwork about what we are hoping for Big Creek uh, to be. Big Creek is our largest 
uh, wastewater treatment plant. We have five altogether in Fulton County. Uh, we serve most of everything outside of the city limits of Atlanta. Atlanta has its own wastewater treatment uh, facilities. Uh, very few of our service area drains into theirs, uh, and likewise, very few of theirs drains into ours. So it's kind of like a, a donut hole with Atlanta being in the middle of, of, the, of the donut and uh, we're above it and below it. But Big Creek is our largest facility. Um, it's been in around since the early 70s. It's gone through a number of improvements and expansions over the years. Uh, but a couple of issues have always been at the forefront of that plant, in particular odor control and odor that has uh, impacted the surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, noise associated with the plants as well as lightning. And so one of the things we really were looking for in the Big Creek uh, expansion project that's underway now is to address those three areas. Even though we were there before the neighborhoods were there uh, and they moved into our neighborhood, so to speak, and we didn't move into theirs, we certainly recognize uh, the, the importance of being a good steward with our with our neighbors. So we wanted to make that first and foremost mo mo in our uh, development of the plants. Like everybody else, we're having issues with, with sludge and, and biosolids, uh, so we want to use this opportunity to maybe look at improvements to those processes. Um, some of the areas that we were looking for with cost-effective delivery uh, involved was modernizing the existing treatment process. We currently have two plants of the five uh, that are using membrane technology. Uh, so we were very anxious to incorporate membranes into this uh, plant as well. And we knew that that was going to require a lot of collaboration between our staff, the operations staff, as well as the design and construction team. So that's one of the reasons why we were so interested in the progressive design build uh, process. Uh, cost long term is always an issue. So we wanted to make sure that that kept us uh, involved in those types of decisions. Uh, as, as we've said, the plant right now is 24 million gallons a day. Uh, initially, we thought we needed to increase it to 38 million gallons a day, uh, but during some of the conceptual work, uh, we really felt more and more comfortable, both from a dem demand as well as a budget standpoint, that we didn't need to go to 38 all in one uh, jump. We could stair step it, so to speak. So we have decided to uh, build a, a 32 million gallon plant, but everything that we're doing is been done from a design and going to be from a construction standpoint with an eye towards minimizing the cost to expand it to 38 million gallons whenever that comes in. Uh, and obviously, uh, being in the, electric, in the metro Atlanta region, we have some pretty stringent uh, waste load allocations are discharges directly into the Chattahoochee River. Um, so uh, we wanted to make sure we, we met those existing and proposed and obviously with membrane technology that makes that so much easier. Uh, so why did we go with uh, progressive design build? Um, first and foremost, uh, Fulton County really wanted to be fully involved in the project. Uh, we wanted to uh, have a, a core team of of individuals on my staff that could work with the core individuals of the uh, progressive uh, design build uh, joint venture team of Brown Caldwell and Archer Western every step of the way. Um, I probably will underestimated the amount of time that desire was going to have on my staff, um, but I think it has paid dividends throughout the entire design process, which Kelly will talk about. But more importantly, we're beginning to see some uh, dividends being paid on the construction side as uh, Archer Western has started on the site. Uh, we chose uh, a, a design, a RFP process instead of an imitation of bid, so we could focus on choosing the most qualified firm. Our selection process for an RFP does not have uh, cost as the only factor. Uh, usually it's less than 20% of the of the the uh, decision of who we choose, unlike an invitation to bid where we're required to go with the long, with the low bid. And we just recently finished a couple of projects with the, with that type of, of establishment of the procurement process, uh, which really has caused some issues. So we were glad that we were able to choose the most qualified firm 
uh, certainly with an eye towards cost, but not necessarily with August with cost being the only thing. Again, talked a little bit about the collaborative design that we were looking for. We also wanted the greater flexibility that being involved would allow us to do. Uh, obviously, operators have their uh, preferred uh, manufacturers of various pieces of equipment in the uh, in the plants. Uh, how things are laid out by being involved with them, we were able to look at that. Uh, the progressive design uh, process also allowed us to look at multiple options, um, and we did look through multiple options throughout the process. Initially, when we started the project, we really thought there was a possibility of utilizing the existing uh, facility for a lot of the uh, expansion. But what we found uh, with our flows, it was just going to be too hard for that to happen. So uh, early on, we were able to move from a conversion of the existing plant to an actually a, a brand new plant with then some repurposing of existing structures at the end of the project. Uh, the other things that we kind of uh, obviously, the progressive design bid process allows us to be very involved with the open book pricing concept uh, and having gone through recently the uh, guaranteed maximum price negotiations. Uh, that open book pricing was very, very instrumental in understanding uh, how the GMP was developed and what areas in there we were able to target to reduce some of the GMP costs that we needed to do. Uh, fortunately, we didn't have to do the exit ramp, but certainly the, pro the progressive design process allows us to uh, basically end the project uh, with the joint venture uh, at the end of the design process if we just could not make the GMP uh, work. Uh, like I said, fortunately, we didn't have to have those types of discussions, but I think everybody knew that we had that option available to us if we needed to get to that. Um, it did allow us to start the construction prior to the design being completed, and I know both Kelly and Pablo are going to talk about that and really the benefits we're seeing right now because we were able to start the construction almost a year earlier than uh, where uh, we initially thought it was going to be. Obviously, uh, there was going to be some time savings as you transition from the design to the construction uh, phases of the project in a traditional design bid build process. Uh, that could be anywhere between a year to two years from the time the design is finished before construction starts. As I said, this allowed uh, us to totally overlap everything. And then we're certainly uh, hoping that the, the constructability issues have already been uh, identified so there won't be uh, any uh, of those types of issues during uh, the construction, mainly because the existing facility is almost at full capacity. We're pushing through on average between 20 and 22 million gallons a day of a 24 million gallon plant. And so we don't have a lot of uh, room for uh, delays or other constructability issues. I just wanted to spend a little bit of talking about our construction, uh, our, our selection process. We did break it down into two phases, the qualification phase as well as the RFP phase. Um, the Really with the idea was the RFP page phase was going to incorporate these three main components, the preliminary design phase, a final design phase, and then the construction phase. Uh, we wound up splitting that construction phase up into a phase two and a phase two a, B, two A and two B to allow us to do some early site work, which Pavel will talk about uh, in a few minutes. On the qualifications uh, side, um, do you want to go to the next slide, please, Kelly? Uh, this this one this or one this one? one. This. Your the the screen. There it is, right there. Well, go back one. There was a little bit of a lag, it looks like. Gotcha. Has it shown up yet? It should say phase one qualifications with a cover of the uh, documents. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's yeah, shown. Oh, sure. there it is. OK, yeah, there, was, there definitely is a little bit of a lag. Um, so we, we did the qualification phase um, really with the hope that we we're going to identify the most qualified firms uh, that would move on to the RFP phase, which would allow us to uh, make the selection process go a little bit quicker. Uh, we wanted to focus on the qualifications of the, the team, mainly being the joint ventures management organization, uh, relevant project experience and key personnel experience. So really none of this dealt with the Big Creek needs specifically. It was more like how is the team uh, organized and then how are we going to um, 
or how they're going to use their experience on our project. Here's uh, uh, how we broke down the, those qualifications by points uh, throughout the, the process. And you can skip over this one to the, that just showed a little bit of the, the timeline. Uh, the, the request for proposal phase uh, then started up and you want to go to the, the next um, page a little bit. Um, the main purpose of the RFP really focused on the actual approach the team was going to have on the Big Creek project and then focused on cost and knowing that the cost was going to be uh, almost impossible to totally uh, get uh, accomplished during the RFP process. We actually broke it up into three groups. We did ask for a lump sum price for the phase 1A. If you remember, the phase 1A was the preliminary design services that we were expecting to last about a, a year or so. And then start giving us some percentages of the uh, probable costs for phases 1B, which was the design, uh, the actual final design. And then phase two was going to be a percentage of the, the, uh, the cost as well. Uh, for final design and then the contractor's fee, including the profit. So we didn't know exactly how much the price of the construction was going to be, but we tried to come up with some ideas of at least ballpark that we could compare one firm to another uh, in uh, the cost element because we did want to make sure that we looked at, at costs as part of the RFP. So some of the lessons that we learned uh, as part of the process, um, we had five firms submit pre-qualifications, um, and I think in hindsight, uh, I, I would have preferred uh, that we were a little bit more uh, diligent during our review of those those for those for five firms. Uh, in all honesty, not all of them uh, really were going to be uh, likely finalists in the project after the the RFP. Uh, so it probably would have been to everybody's better interest not to move all five forward. Uh, we did move all five forward. Uh, we did think we graded them fairly and firmly, um, but at the same time, uh, we probably should have looked at um, the qualification process a little bit more closely than we actually did. Uh, some of the other areas that um, is very important, um, procurement agents uh, need to be bought into the progressive design build process. Uh, we were fortunate, we have a very strong advocate of design, progressive design build in particular projects uh, in our purchasing agent. Uh, and so she really led a lot of leadership with her staff of how to define their roles. Uh, but more importantly, she also was a great conduit to our attorney's office. Uh, our attorney's office, um, like most attorneys, were very, very, cautiously conservative when it came to talking about these types of procurements, especially when we were getting uh, into a contract with a contractor where we didn't know what the price of the project was going to be at the end. Um, but we were able to work with them and because our procurement staff was so much in favor of this process, it almost was two against one that we were able to get the, uh, the attorneys on board with us. Um, it did take a lot more time uh, in the development of the RFP than other uh, methods. Uh, there's a lot more questions that were asked by the different firms during the uh, question and answer period uh, that we had to spend a lot of time getting them in information pretty quickly uh, for them to do their uh, proposal documentation. Uh, one of the things that we did find, um, and we probably should have thought this out a little bit further, but with five firms, we got five very different formats of RFPs. They all answered the same information, but they all packaged it very, very differently. So it took a lot of time to go from one proposal to the other to understand the different writing styles and the, the various uh, format changes that they made. So I think in the future, we would have preferred to have a much more standardized format of showing people, this is how we want your project experience to be, and this is how we want your personnel to be listed, as opposed to leaving it up to them, because uh, it just was one of those things that all the information was there, it just was so hard to find it, especially when you started going from one proposal to the other. Um, the way that we structured our fee uh, 
in the proposal I think was very good. Um, but at the same time, you have to remember that the engineering costs are so minor compared to the total construction cost. We only had phase 1A as true costs. Everything else were the percentages. Um, and a couple of firms certainly played the game where they gave us a very, very low phase 1A uh, cost to do the preliminary. But then if you start di diving into some of their construction cost percentages and the fees, that's where they were putting a lot of their money. So initially it looked like they we were getting a very good deal with some of the firms. But when you actually looked at the entire length of the project, you were going to see that it was going to be much more cost uh, expensive on the back end. Uh, definitions are always, uh, always or are always a challenge. Uh, we have our kind of set uh, terminology that we like to use from the owner side, and we found out that that does not exactly um, blend very well with the the joint venture teams as how they cost or they provided information in the uh, proposals. And finally, the, the contingencies remain an issue even through the GMP. That always was a an, an issue. Uh, contingencies impacted each cost proposal. And then again, just like how some of the firms played the, the numbers game with phase 1A versus phase 2 uh, costs, other firms played similar type of accounting games with uh, contingencies of how that was going to impact their cost proposals. And so again, some type of consistency was was needed for, the, for all that. So that really was the procurement process overall. Uh, we think it went very well. It took longer than we initially thought it was going to be, uh, but at the end of the day, We've flushed out a lot of good issues uh, that needed to be talked about, uh, so that allowed us to really hit the ground running with Phase uh, 1A and the preliminary design services when really Brown and Caldwell took over. So I'll turn it over to you, Kelly. Thanks, David. David. And David. just a reminder, reminder to everyone, to everyone um, um, if, if if you if want, want to, to uh, ask a question, go ahead and put it in the in the chat, and, and we can get it answered. Um, so the preliminary design services phase, phase 1A, was really a critical, one of the most critical aspects of the project because it, it, it allowed the team to come together, the owner, the joint venture, and really work together in defining what the project was going to be from the overall approach to sizing to the process. There were a lot of upfront decisions that needed to be made so that we could move into the design and everybody was satisfied with what the end product would be. So there were a series of workshops over about a four-month period where everybody uh, put a ton of time in working together. A lot of work was done in advance, um, educating each other in terms of the different op uh, options and opportunities so that when we went into all of these workshops, we were able to make decisions and, and come out um, with, with the direction. Um, having the contractor on board during this process was invaluable because we were able to look at real-time pricing for the various alternatives and potential schedule impact that really helped allow us to make the proper decision. Um, additionally, identifying risks and, and how we would mitigate those risks uh, through construction or other options um, was incredibly important. And during this phase, we also reached out to the public and stakeholders um, to allow them to begin to understand what was gonna be happening. There was no construction that was gonna be happening during this phase, but it was, able, it was a time period to be able to reach out to them and let them know what was coming down the road. All of this was consolidated into a design development report, all the decisions so that that was submitted to the state for approval, um, and that would initiate the permitting process associated with the facility. So during the initial upfront workshops, um, the decision was made by the county um, in terms of the overall treatment process. Uh, flow would come into the plant, go through coarse screens, grit removal. Uh, the decision was made to add primary clarifiers, and that benefited the downstream BNR, allowing that to be smaller. Um, fine screens would be put in place to help protect the downstream membranes, uh, enhanced biological nutrient removal, and membrane bioreactors would be implemented. As David mentioned, that, that's a critical decision that they made even prior to the initiation of the project that they wanted to implement that uh, here at Big Creek. Following membranes, the permeate goes through UV disinfection and then post aeration before it's discharged to the Chattahoochee River. Uh, Fulton County does provide reuse at some of their other facilities for, for non-potable uses. Um, in this case, all of the, the potential reuse is just internal to the plant site, um, and so that is recycled back around. On the solids handling side, the decision was made to stay with aerobic digestion, um, and so aerobic digesters were provided, and then uh, dewatering via screw presses uh, was the process that was selected, and, and their residuals currently go to landfill uh, for disposal. 
So this is an image of the current uh, plant site. As David mentioned, there's there's a lot of uh, uh, tankage out there, and one of the one of the goals of the county was to beneficially reuse as much of that as possible. Flow comes in through the headworks, goes to a BNR process, goes through secondary clarifiers, and then travels um, through the site, uh, goes to tertiary filters, UV, and post aeration, and then gets discharged um, to the to the to the Chattahoochee River. They did have um, current aerobic digesters that really weren't in good structural shape, so they they did not want to reuse those. Um, those basins, but the others, the BNR tanks and the secondary clarifiers, they definitely wanted to see if they could find a beneficial reuse for those. And so one of the earliest concepts, the decision points that had to be made was, is it possible to retrofit uh, membra membranes into the existing BNR tanks? Um, the, the current plant runs at around two to 3,000 milligrams per liter. And one of the advantages of uh, membrane bioreactors is you, you run at a much higher mixed liquor, around 8,000 8, 8, um, to 10,000 milligrams per liter. And so that allows you to have the BNR process in much smaller tank volumes. So even going to 38, there was conceptually possible to uh, retrofit those existing BNR tanks and potentially save a bunch of construction costs. Or the other alternative, they have a large tract of land here that wasn't being used. We could construct a greenfield plant um, and, and new BNR and MBR tankage within, within that area. So that had to be uh, a decision point that was made early on. And the progressive design build um, approach really made this type of decision. Um, it really, it really made that process meaningful and allowed the county to make the right decision. Because what we found is technically, yes, we could fit the membranes within the existing BNR uh, basins. And so, at first thought, the 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 thought is great. We're going to save a lot of money in construction. But then, as you actually got involved with the actual phasing of construction. And Archer Western was able to walk through exactly what would have to happen to do that um, and the schedule and cost associated that with that. It was su significant. Um, each one of those trains would have to be taken offline and membranes retrofitted into that train. Then it would have to be commissioned and brought online. And then that particular train would be running at a higher mixed liquor concentration than the others. So the plant at that point would be running two different treatment trains within the, that's in the same set of basins. And then one at a time, each one of those basins would have to be taken offline. With 10 different basins, you're looking at about six months per basin. So as, as you got through the logistics of that, you're looking at a five-year construction period. So a substantial time frame associated with that. Then overlay that with the fact that the plant would have to be operating two different technologies at the same time for that five-year period. It, it really sh showed that there was a huge amount of risk for potential permit violation during that period versus the concept of a greenfield construction where you could go in, the contractor could construct the entire thing. It could be commissioned and brought online before any wastewater ever went through it for treatment to go to the river to allow the plant to continue operating as it is for the next four years while this new facility is being constructed. So when you overlay what's possible with actual cost impacts, schedule impacts and risk impacts, it became a no brainer that the direction to go truly should be new construction uh, versus retrofitting those, those existing basins. So here's the, the overall concept for the new facility. Flow will be coming in and intercepted with the current um, pumped uh, force mains that come in. It will go to a new headworks facility, uh, new primary clarifiers, fine screens, BNR, MBR, uh, UV post aeration, and that'll flow to its existing outfall into the Chattahoochee River. Um, what this new construction did allow us to do is look at these existing facilities and say, okay, maybe there's another potential use. And I mentioned before that the, the current digester tanks really aren't amenable for, for use because of their age. Um, however, those BNR basins are in great shape. And the fact that um, there's existing blowers and existing diffusers within them, we were able to retrofit and basically convert those BNR tanks into aerobic digesters. So still fully able to utilize that investment that the county had, had put in place um, years ago. Additionally, the secondary clarifiers, they, they provide almost 5 million gallons worth of volume. And so by putting an overflow channel at the primary clarifiers, we could have a passive gravity online equalization of clarified water um, to be able to uh, use that 5 million gallons of inline equalization during really high flow events. And once again, put those to beneficial reuse and, and um, have that benefit. Um, 
the county had invested recently in screw presses, screw press technology for the existing plant. And so the decision was made to reuse those screw presses, add a couple additional for additional capacity, but to relocate them to a new dewatering building. And that's actually on the critical path because the current dewatering building sits in the place of the current headworks. So uh, as we get into construction, you'll see the critical path is to get the dewatering building in place, relocate the screw presses over there um, so that then the headworks could be could be put online. And then the decision was made to in the layout to pr preserve some future flexibility for the county. Um, the, the current admin and lab building will stay in use as well as the operations building and maintenance building, but space was reserved up front for them to be able to put in a um, admin building there in the future and a conceptual design uh, was, was put in place for that to lay that all out. Additionally, they're currently using aerobic digestion. For, for them, um, that's the best technology and the best approach now, but they recognize that that may change over time uh, and they may have to look at other, other residuals handling options. So they wanted to preserve this location on site so that they have a uh, footprint available to, to look at other technologies in the future and still be able to reuse the new dewatering building. So that, that space was, was preserved. The other benefit that the new greenfield construction of the BNR and MBR allowed us to do was play with the hydraulic profile. If we reuse the existing tankage, that uh, obviously that set that hydraulic profile, but we're able to adjust the, the um, primary clarifiers as well as the BNR basins such that we're going to be able to go through the entire plant by gravity. Um, right now, all the flow is pumped to the site. And so then just diverting that flow, it's, it's not having to be pumped into anything. We can go by gravity through the headworks, primary clarifiers all the way down and even through the membranes. There's enough head available to run through the membranes by gravity, which is a huge cost savings to the county. That constitutes about $13 million over a 30 year period. So this um, was, was a great uh, benefit to, to locating a greenfield construction um, in the adjacent area. So um, during this phase 1A, when these decisions were made, um, the initial permitting process uh, was initiated. This design development report went to EPD. We also engaged City of Roswell, who's the authority having jurisdiction where the plant is located, um, as well as the Atlanta Regional Commission, because we, we lie within the, um, the Merpa corridor on the Chattahoochee River, and initiate all of that early so that it um, wouldn't slow down the uh, permitting process during final design and construction. We also began outreach to the public, having some initial public meetings, letting the neighbors know what was happening and launching a, a website in parallel, providing them with regular updates. And that's the BigCreekExpansion.com if you want more information on the project site. Um, the, the, the reach out was very positive. All of the surrounding neighbors, obviously, David had mentioned the odor control that was there previously. They wanted this plant to move forward. Um, as well as environmental groups on the Chattahoochee River, because the existing discharge at 24 MGD had a certain waste load. And coming in with membrane technology allows us to get to much lo higher levels of treatment, even such that at 38 million gallons a day, the overall waste load to the Chattahoochee River is up to 50% less than what the current permitted discharge is at 24 MGD. So the amount of ammonia, the amount of um, phosphorus going to the river will be substantially reduced, even though this plant is being designed for a larger capacity. So a lot of the environmental groups uh, along the Chattahoochee River were excited about this. Um, this plant is upstream of several other water users. Um, so the higher level of treatment that can be provided, the better uh, for the safety of the region in general. Um, so as we moved into final design services, we continued to collaborate among all team uh, members. One of the things that really helped facilitate this was the use of Revit um, to develop full 3D BIM models. Um, they allowed everyone from the operations to see what things actually look like, and they're not just looking at 2D drawings, um, but, but they could plan out how they would access equipment, how they would be able to operate and make decisions in terms of facility layout. The, the BIM models actually get turned over to the contractor during construction so that they can uh, integrate their, their, their poor schedules and the layouts that they use during the construction process and actually bring in the full models of all the shop drawings so that in the end, the end model that gets turned over to the owner is a true 3D uh, 
depiction of what was actually installed in the field. Um, and that allows them a uh, great benefit in terms of longer planning from an O&M perspective or being able to, to modify things in the future. So some of the add-in software that was used includes Siskiyou, which is a, a module for piping that allows the true uh, pipe supplied by various manufacturers to be modeled properly. And so we did that in the design up front so that we knew we were allocating for proper space for all piping. We used Civil 3D for site work and that we used BIM 360 for cloud-based sharing. And so that allowed all of the designers to have access as well as Archer Western and the county at any time. So as the design progressed, if they didn't want to wait for a deliverable, they could get in and they could look at and see how things were progressing on a daily basis and have full access to, to see how to see how things look. We did have regular um, sit down reviews at key milestones, 30 percent, 60 percent, 80 percent. Um, the, the GMP was based on the 80% design, and then once the GMP was approved, we finished the design to 100%. Um, the key equipment suppliers were selected prior to 80%, and that allowed us to customize the design at the very end around the actual equipment that was going to be supplied and not have to uh, leave flexibility in the design for worst case. Um, we were able to, to really hone in and optimize the design for the individual selected uh, pieces of equipment. And that'll aid in construction because during construction, the, the, the drawings are that much uh, more accurate. Um, one of the big procurement decisions that, that had to be made was the membranes. Um, there are various technologies that are out there, hollow fiber or flat plate, and they impact not only the sizing of the membrane tanks in the gallery, but also the actual BNR process. So it was really important for us to make that decision prior to the 80% mark so that the design could really be optimized around the selected technology. Um, and the, because it was such a large procurement item, the county wanted to retain the procurement process for that. So they actually issued an RFP and went through the process. Um, we, we sort of met with all of the membrane suppliers and shortlisted the acceptable ones. Um, and they, the county issued the RFP, which was a very technical RFP and received the proposals. The county had a selection committee and, and the JV served as technical advisors showing pros and cons um, of each one of those. We actually had conceptual dr drawings and layouts for the BNR and membranes for each of the different technologies. So not only would we look at the cost of the individual membranes, but the impact of their technology on the overall cost of the project. So that allowed a, a holistic full uh, evaluation of the total cost. The county scored the proposals and um, ultimately made the selection based on best value. And you can see here the weight that they had on the various criteria. And they, they have been operating membrane facilities, so they, they know um, some of the challenges that can be out there in terms of O&M. Um, and so they weighed very heavily O&M considerations associated with the various technologies. And in the end, they selected the Kubota uh, flat plate uh, membrane as the technology of choice. So following all the procurement and the design, we, we transitioned into construction. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Pavel, who's going to uh, talk about that. Uh, thank you, Kelly. But before I start talking about construction, I wanted to, on behalf of GEV, uh, once again, thank uh, Fulton County for the trust they put in us in our uh, joint venture design build team in uh, being a partner and trusted partner uh, during this process. Uh, trust me, uh, uh, trust is hard to earn, but very easy to, to, to lose. And uh, we've worked really hard jointly in the past three years, as Steve had pointed out, in making sure that we actually follow through on <clears throat> commitments we've made during the RFP process. And one of the services we provided is implementation of the constructability into design uh, from the early on. And that is uh, possible under the uh, progressive design build. How many times we've heard on the heartbeat jobs uh, from uh, construction folks that it can be built that way or it can be done. What they're, what were designers thinking about this, right? And uh, there is a lot of challenges in a lot of those cases, the client ends up uh, paying uh, for some of the changes or some of the adjustments. In this specific case, all of those things we were able to actually discuss and address during the design phase. And the second part is the uh, challenges that we all deal with the construction uh, industry these days. It's either labor shortages, uh, pay escalations, or overall quality of the labor force. By looking at the design early and being a part of the design efforts, it allowed us to address a lot of those concerns. And uh, there are three major things that we were looking at. Schedule, as uh, Kelly pointed out, when we were making uh, 
evaluations of uh, uh, design approaches. Uh, uh, we were looking at the sequencing and we were looking at the maintenance of plant, not only during the operations uh, or not during the construction, but also during the uh, operation later on. And a big and valuable part in that is when you actually involve uh, actual superintendents in the early design stages to review all of the details uh, that will be used on the project during the design and how can things be built faster, better, or how can they be man maintained better later. Uh, one, one thing we did on this project, we tried to make sure that we have uniformity in between the structures and within individual structures, that being either size of the walls, heights of the walls, make sure that they're all the same size. We try to make sure that they're all flat. Uh, we try to make sure that the same height and the height is exact. It's either 20 feet, not 20 feet 0.73. Uh, it, it allows for ease of construction, it, it allows for repetitive operations and it minimizes an opportunity for an error. The other thing that we actually did, we jumped on a construction schedule and development of the construction schedule very, very early. At the completion of the initial conceptual design phase, phase 2A, we had a construction schedule that had 1,200 activities and that allowed us to really, really understand how the project is going to be built how it's going to be actually maintained, put in service, all of the switchovers were addressed, a lot of MOPO activities were part of it. The industry issues that we always had, uh, or we currently have, deal with the either labor shortages or uh, the quality of the field labor force. So what we try to do as part of this constructability review is to make sure that we specify a lot of uh, <clears throat> uh, components of the uh, construction to be prefabricated off-site. We made sure that the pumps would actually come pre-assembled on the skids, so to speak, more of a, a plug-and-play approach rather than it's a custom fit and assembly in the field. That allows not only to save time during the schedule, it allows also to control quality better. better. And speaking about time, you have to always be mindful about direct cost and indirect costs. Direct cost, it's a cost of construction, materials, labor, but indirect cost of time. And as David pointed out earlier, we were able to actually shrink construction duration on this large project through the means of these uh, reviews. And I submit to you, time on a project, every day on the project like this costs a lot of money. And in a lot of cases, you can save a lot of money by being mindful of that and having the construction team involved, which we were able to do. Uh, site investigative work will actually involved a lot of specialty subs and we did uh, do a lot of in-depth investigation investigative work not only on the uh, subsurface conditions but electrical systems instrumentation systems in order to allow us and condition of existing structures in order to allow us to make the life uh, right decisions of ease of conversion what do we keep what we repurpose and what we actually replace and demolish at the end of the project and if we go into the maintenance of a plant operation thought as part of the uh, construction uh, constructability review, I always like to ask three questions. When do you start it? Why are you doing it? And what are you doing, right? And the answer to the when is very simple. You start it as early as possible. You actually do it when you put your RFP together in response to the, uh, or proposal together in response to the owner's RFP. You need to know what kind of services you're going to provide, what kind of options you're going to offer the client. And <clears throat> you need to be a trusted advisor. I'm, I'm privileged to say that I think we accomplished that mission so far uh, with our partnership with Brown and Coldwell, and we intend to do so as well. Uh, what do we do? Um, Kelly, if you could please jump back to you. Um, and, and why are we doing it? Uh, well, we actually want to make sure that not only we uh, address the plant operations during construction. As Kelly pointed out, a uh, major decision we had to make either we retrofit existing tanks or we install new uh, or we build new uh, membrane building. We need to answer the question, uh, how easy is it going to be construct? How much it's going to impact plant operations during construction, but also uh, how easy it's going to be operate when we leave the site? And I submit to you, a lot of thought goes into this and the fact that we had uh, such an extensive construction schedule 
actually allowed us to think through that. And what we used, we used the schedule. We tried to make sure that we think of all the sequencing, all the tie-ins, all the switchovers that we're going to need to do. And we need to engage every design build team, needs to engage plant operations and maintenance staff because those guys know the best, right? They know how their plant runs. They know what has built show, what they might not show. So engagement of those in interaction with the plant operations is a huge part of that. Uh, and that actually translates into the risk. We look at the project and the risks associated with that on a project specific basis and on the market conditions. Project specific basis is financial risks. Uh, in a lot of cases, we have to design to budget and those design build teams need to be very mindful of that. We always knew that we have a budget to meet and we try to address that. From a technical uh, <clears throat> side of risks, it's a constructability review, right? We knew we have technical risks, so let's review it. As I mentioned, maintenance of plant operations. Let's make sure that the plant operations are intact during construction and uh, that it's easy to operate later. On the environmental side, we did a lot of investigative work on site to make sure that we know what's underground, we know the condition of the existing facilities and how to actually properly address those and price them as well. On the political side of things, Kelly touched on it. We did a lot of outreach events, and even if David said that those neighbors uh, came after Fulton County was there, we had to be mindful of the, them being there. And what we tried to do, as Kelly said, we will we held outreach events and we educated the surrounding communities on the benefits of this construction. It's a huge, huge component that we need to be always mindful of. On the market side, labor pool, I touched on it, quality, pay rates, availability, we all suffer from that. So we identified that risk early. We knew we had to address it and shifting some of the construction off site, having those pre-packaged, pre-fabricated um, items as much as we can. And we really address that. Uh, tariffs, that's something to be mindful of and properly actually price and identify because you can say that the risk can be viewed as an opportunity if you actually early identify it and properly manage it. On a sub vendor default, I'll touch on the procurement efforts later, we try to make sure we can underwrite those subs and vendors properly in order to make sure that they are not only the cheapest on the project upfront, but they're actually providing best value and from the risk perspective, and lowest risk and the best value from the project perspective long term. Cost estimating and designing to budget, as Kelly pointed out, as the design was progressing, we actually provided the estimates of what it would be at uh, completion of the initial phase A, uh, which uh, was a early conceptual design. We provided cost estimate at 30, 60%, and at 80% design, we provided our GMP price. We were able to actually price design alternative in real, in real time, as Kelly pointed out. And one good thing that we've done on this project, and I think everybody should be considering, is involvement of the specialty subcontractors and vendors during the design phase and site investigative phase and uh, at any given time. In our case, we had electrical subcontractor who was involved and instrumentation subcontractor. Later on, we also added a precast subcontractor to provide the guidance and actually help with some of the site investigative work. That's huge when you have those guys who know do it for a living and they actually can advise you on uh, what would work, what won't work. And <clears throat> we also made sure that we have a design that would facilitate competitive procurement. It's part of the best value and the pro pro part of the cost savings that the client would realize. Yes, as Kayla pointed out, we did have a few specialty vendors that we designed around, but for the most part, the plant and the specifications were designed to, uh, to facilitate competitive procurement. Uh, when, we, when the time comes to the GMP development, the good thing is that since we've done so much cost modeling and everything else, we had a very good idea and client knew, had a good idea of what the project cost would be way before the final GMP number came in. The GMP was based on 80% design documents and as part of the construction phase, as Kayla pointed out, our scope included advancing design from 80 to 100, but at the same time, it allows us when all the equipment is locked in, 
everything is selected. It allows us to fine tune the design, not change it, but fine tune the de final design to accommodate for that specialty equipment and specific pieces of equipment and vendors that uh, had been selected. One thing I'll mention, you have to have a plan when you go into your uh, GMP and procurement. And what I mean by that, you have to know that <clears throat> how you're going to advertise the procurement. You need to know what your end goal is. And in our case, it was the best value for Fulton County from the risk perspective and performance and cost perspective. And advertise that plan, share it with the client, share it with the Fulton County, uh, with your design partner, and make sure that everybody is on the same page. Because sometimes people need to be told, educated to understand. And you cannot imagine how smooth the process goes if everybody is on the same page and they follow the plan. In our case, as part of the plan, we held a few outreach events and we made sure that community of the subcontractors and vendors in our region are fully aware of our plans, how the procurement is going to go, and what kind of opportunities they would have. As a result, instead of just direct cost, direct bid, we actually issued 75 RFPs, similar to the process that Fulton County had uh, gone through, and as we, that procurement was done by the uh, design builder the partner uh, Archer Western and Brown and Coldwell. And RFPs were geared towards the best value. Yes, they, we looked at the costs because we have to make sure that we are within the budget on the, on the, on the overall design. But at the same time, you know, uh, the cheap price you pay today might actually cost you more at the end of the day. So as part of the selection process, we looked at the qualifications of those SOPs and are we going to be able to underwrite them properly from the risk perspective? When the GMP was put together and submitted to the client, we made sure that we provide the level of breakdown that is warranted so the client can properly evaluate our GMP and make sure that it's accurate based on the true market conditions. We also made sure that we follow with the guidelines of the Water Design Build Council and we properly allocate the contingencies and allowances based on the risk allocation. It's not just a percentage that you read in the book and say, okay, I got to have seven, eight, ten percent, five, four, but you actually look at the true value of the risk and that's what your contingencies should be and who should hold that, uh, should, who should be responsible for that risk. We made sure that it's open, it's factual, it's based on actual numbers rather than some percentages from somewhere else. Um, as we move forward, Kelly, uh, yep. as a result, as a result, uh, not only we were able to stay open, transparent, uh, in touch with the market conditions, but as we were designing the plant, we were able to recognize the fact that there is a huge opportunity in actually doing an early site work package in order to address some of the risk constraint, risk issues, and uh, schedule. Uh, as a result, we were successfully able to negotiate early site work package with the Fulton County, which allowed us to reprocess a lot of existing materials on site and reuse it on site. That minimized impact on the surrounding communities. We advertised that, people were appreciative of that. At the same time, with the <clears throat> very much smaller overhead during the early uh, construction phase, we were able to save time during the main construction phase, which is once again, time is money, but what's even more important, we were able to minimize the risk of stacking up the uh, activities on site between earthwork, under slab work, overcast piles, and we also were able to prepare the full site for the true construction activities by relocating some of the existing utilities from underneath the footprint of the future construction. And as you can see, phase 2A had started in uh, late uh, 2019, and I'm uh, pleased to tell you that at this point uh, that phase is uh, complete and we moved on site as part of the phase 2B. One thing I would also mention is we were mindful of the off-ramp that client still has, even if we have great relationship with the client and we were appreciative and we, were, we are very appreciative of the opportunity. We were made, we tried to make sure that whatever scope we do as part of the early construction phase is not 
actually locking the client in uh, into giving us work on a phase to be. We were very transparent, open, and we explained to Fulton County what it means, uh, what it would mean for us to do an initial phase and how it does not lock them in and awarding us a contract for 2B if we cannot agree on the GMP. It's important thing, it's trust thing, and that's something that I feel that uh, any design builder needs to be very transparent with the client and not try to play games. At this point, we'll, I'll just touch base a little bit on the 2A, and uh, when we talk about early packages, well, while design is still progressing, uh, I touched on it, it needs to be beneficial to the client and the project first and foremost. In our case, it provided cost and schedule savings on the overall project. It addressed some of the risks that we had by relocating some of the conflicting utilities early and allowed us to really manage the resources by not stacking different trades on top of each other, considering the constraints and of the uh, site layout that we are dealing with here. Uh, Phase 2B that we just recently started on uh, about two months ago, that will be a 46 months long project and uh, the first 40 months we will uh, build the new liquid train, we will uh, we construct, we'll construct new dewatering building and the new dewatering building will be constructed in the first 18 months of the project that would allow us to decommission existing one, demolish it as it uh, partially conflicts with the new handworks structure. Once the new treatment plant construction is complete within the first 60, uh, 40 months and put in service, we will be able to decommission the existing plant and either demolish or repurpose some of the existing structures. In our case, we are repurposing clarifiers into the EQ basins and we are actually repurposing aeration basins into the uh, digesters. And we'll have a short video to show you guys. Um, it starts with the phase 2A. Uh, as I mentioned, started late 19. We did some site work, re uh, processed 160,000 yards of rock soil material and kept majority of it on site. Did partial demolition of the existing abandoned clarifiers and realigned access road for easier access. As part of 2B, we started immediately on the new dewatering building, clarifiers, BNRs and BRs. Currently, we're installing overcast piles everywhere, everywhere, and we started slabs on grade. As you can see, the watering building is progressing faster than any other structure, just because we need to finish it within the first 18 months. The activities on site pretty much involve all of the structures, major structures at the same time, which is challenging, but we address that as well by having two tower cranes and about four or five crawler cranes. As we move closer to the end of 2021, 2020, uh, uh, we will see that the watering building construction will be complete, that structure will be put in service, and an existing will be demolished. Once that is done and major structures are out of the ground, we will uh, actually start construction of the odor control, chemical facilities, uh, completion of the electrical building within a footprint that we used originally to access, uh, better access with the construction equipment to build the uh, new uh, major structures. In the early 2023, we will power up the plant, new electrical building will be complete, we'll start powering up existing structures and testing uh, equipment with those, uh, within those structures and uh, uh, structural systems as, as a full components. At the completion of the uh, liquid end, at the, at the end of 40 months period, we'll put the plant online, we'll start demolition of the existing abandoned structures and we will be repurposing uh, uh, existing structures for the EQ basins and the uh, digesters. At the early 24, uh, 2024, the project would be complete and we will demob, regrade the site and uh, turn the project over to the client. 
So current status on the project real quick. Um, design at this stage is uh, fully complete for the watering building and uh, foundations for the major structures so we can actually start the construction. That once again was also a thought out process to where the key uh, structures that are on the critical path of the project design is advanced a little bit faster and allows us to start the construction while the design is being completed on the rest of the uh, facility. We are in the QAQC phase of the 100% design on the, on the facility as a whole, and uh, the doc design documents will be submitted to Fulton County early December. Uh, as I mentioned previously, phase 2A is complete, and now phase 2B, uh, main construction of the facility, we mobilized on site. We are heavily involved in the procurement and submittals right now. We are installing ogrecast piles throughout the site and uh, started construction of uh, foundations of uh, some of the key uh, structures that are on critical path. We will have a flyover video of the project. One thing that you will also notice is how uh, neat and organized project is currently with all of the uh, excavation stabilization in, uh, in place. And while a lot of the um, site is developed and construction is happening within those areas, um, we, uh, we've benefited greatly from the early site work package where we were able to excavate, grade the site, put everything on subgrades and uh, stabilize all the soils, get us prepared for the winter and allow us to actually build during the winter months without uh, major impacts of the weather conditions. We also made sure that we strategically play, uh, place stockpiles of soils uh, next to the structures that will be demolished in the future and backfilled. Once again, having that orderly progression with the early phase allowed us to manage that better, allowed us to actually think through that and how it would benefit the client and the construction of the project in the, in the long run. With that in mind, I think we're complete with our presentation. Thank you very much for listening and uh, we'll open up uh, the discussion for questions. Thanks, Pavel. This is uh, Steve again, and um, we have uh, two ways to manage the questions here. I don't see any in the chat, so if there are questions, just to keep organized a little bit, there's a little icon on your control panel that looks like a hand. If you press that, you're hand is raised and then I can call people from there. <clears throat> See, I do have something in the conversation here. Craig Parker, uh, thank you for that question. Craig has asked the question team, and maybe we'll just go down the row with starting with David. What was your biggest challenge of the project so far and uh, how did you handle it? Sure, Steve, um, and that, that is a very good question. From at least from the owner's perspective, I would say cost during the design phase of what the construction was going to be was was a huge one. We, in in hindsight, we should have had a lot more difficult conversations about cost uh, earlier in the process instead of at the sixty percent uh, phase. We knew very early on after the um, phase one A was finished that we were way over budget. But as one of the um, slides that Pavel showed, that had kind of had a wave going that hopefully the price was going to come down. We we didn't experience that wave. It, it kind of stayed up and stayed uh, where it was through most of the 30 and 60 percent phase. And so I, I think I would have liked to had that difficult conversation about what to design out of the project earlier in the process instead of during the 60 to 80 percent GMP phase. Yeah, that's a great answer and I'll go to Kelly, but while he's thinking I'll uh, add a little bit of fuel to that that fire. Uh, the, the good news is, uh, well, uh, start with an observation. The, the challenge that the team had, and it's a regular challenge, which is 
um, when you get involved in a plant expansion, uh, particularly, there's a lot of needs, uh, and then there's some some wants, and, and the operation staff who have to live with the project forever uh, naturally have have a lot of wants, <laughs> and um, so getting the balance point right between what was actually needed and what was affordable took a lot of lot of discussion, and uh, uh, one of the benefits of design build as I see it uh, really comes forth in this case history, which is if this had been a traditional design bid build process, the design team probably would have proceeded merrily along with the long list of wants that the owner wanted. And on, on bid day, we would have had a $380 million uh, bid. <clears throat> and, uh, that's when David would have said, oh, my goodness, what am I going to do now compared to my $300 million budget? And there would have been a lot of time and energy redesigning or who knows what. But having the opportunity to examine those costs as we went, um, we eventually did have those brave conversations and uh, worked really hard on the DB side to figure out how to be most economical. And David did uh, great job on his side trying to bring his uh, his operation staff along who you know had had their wants list so in this case I think the design build process worked, worked to everybody's advantage uh, but I agree with David if we had a little bit more clarity on just what all the constraints were from the beginning and, and a little bit more brave conversation among all of us that would have been, would have been very helpful good, good lesson learned Kelly, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Uh, uh, well, I, I would just say one one of the challenges that we had that I don't think anybody expected was um, when when we went through the membrane procurement that that took a lot longer than originally anticipated, just based on the on the on the county's procurement process. And so, as a team, we had to have some flexibility in um, sort of progressing some parallel designs so that so that we could we can make progress, and then ultimately shifting the schedule somewhat you know, working really, really closely with Pavel and what the critical path is um, so that so that we made sure that the design got finished in those particular areas that that allowed them to progress and the membranes lagged a little bit compared compared to the rest and, and are now now finally caught up. But um, during during the last year or so, um, they'd always been a little bit behind because of the because of that um, that additional procurement time that it took. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I I appreciate that commentary, and I have to be careful. I don't sound like a a showman for design build because it's it's not always the best and right delivery model. But as long as we're talking about this particular project, one uh, aspect that uh, uh, Pavel noted and is highlighted with this piece of conversation is that uh, because of this schedule slippage around the procurement process. Uh, we collaborated together and A decided on this 2A package that got us going earlier in the construction and B, the early uh, concrete work is now proceeding with that piece of design complete uh, while the rest of the project design is still playing out. So with the flexibility of progressive design build, we could overcome the schedule challenges that presented themselves uh, in this case around a very important project decision related to getting the right uh, procurement package for the membranes, which is, of course, a critically important piece of the treatment process. So we want to take the right amount of time to get that right, you know, all that that means technically and economically. And uh, Skelly said it took longer than it you know, was planned, but we've overcome that challenge with uh, phased construction and design. Pavel, do you have a, a challenge that um, kept you up or keeps you up at night? <laughs> well, there is a lot of challenges, but I'll uh, they keep me up at night. But I'll I'll touch on uh, something that Kelly had said and David. Uh, first schedule, uh, Kelly mentioned that uh, it was it is uh, somewhat aggressive design schedule. Uh, I was impressed with the speed that our design partner was moving. And at times it was a challenge in us making sure that we align our estimating efforts with the design deliverables. Uh, 
looking back, I would schedule our uh, time frame in between of getting the uh, milestone designs and uh, having the uh, cost component prepared. I would give a lot of, uh, would allow us more time. It, it is really an effort. And in terms of the schedule, also challenges. Uh, it takes everybody working together in, may, in order to make sure that the schedule is actually maintained. A lot of decisions had to be made in the early programming phase. And I was very, very impressed by the level of Fulton County involvement uh, and personnel involvement and dedication to make sure that they not only participate in those discussions, but they actually make decisions. That's a huge, huge component in, in, to make sure that the client is prepared, willing and empowered to make the decisions when they need to be made so the design can uh, progress forward. In terms of the cost component, a lot of uh, the <clears throat> anticipation that we had was uh, uh, that the cost would go down during the as the design advances, but we experienced uh, the uh, <clears throat> shortage in labor force, and we've seen all in the past two or three years uh, substantial uh, increases in uh, labor costs that uh, that uh, uh, we're incurring. Uh, hourly wages go uh, went up substantially that we experienced. One thing I will tell you is that we engaged a lot of our uh, equipment suppliers early, and those prices actually maintained throughout the project and actually went down during the procurement process. Um, and specific to the cost, design was structured with expendability in mind, plug and play to where we knew that if we need to either dial back a design, it can easily be done with, uh, done with a minimal impact on the design of the project as a whole, more or less plug and play, but also would allow the client expendability in the future. That's not the best answer, obviously. We would prefer to see the curve of the costs going down, but um, I do think that we try to make sure that we have a plan B, which might not be the most popular one, but we had plan B to how to get to the budget we need to get. And once again, you need to be flexible. You need to be talking as part of the team. And as David pointed out, uh, you need to have those hard conversations. Then the things cannot be addressed if they're not voiced. Thanks, uh, Pavel. And, and uh, one thing I hear from many design build teams, particularly uh, uh, that have, uh, are new to the process, there's an intensity to design build contracting that's higher and unusual, than, uh, if you will, compared to other delivery models, uh, design bid build, for example. I think we heard David say earlier he spent more time than he realized he was going to. Pavel talked about the resources, and I can tell you our design team has had their tongues hanging out panting for a number of months now. Um, and it's, uh, it's just something to be aware of. Some some organizations and people can tolerate that or thrive on it, and some uh, struggle with the, with the level of intensity. But with the, I guess it's the cost of the, you know, the scheduled benefit and the complexity of sequencing, et cetera, comes from with the cost of uh, more energy applied to uh, create the successful project. So good on this team for that. Uh, I had a couple of questions from our friend Rob Bocaro at the city of Atlanta. And then, um, Lindsay, I'm going to skip over Rob for a minute and get to your question, which is um, uh, one I meant to address in my introductory comments, but I'll let David answer this question, which is, does Fulton County have a lot of internal design build experience and staff? Are you getting help from external resources or do you have any perspective to offer on staffing slash experience considerations for the owner? And Rob, I'll come back to you. And Dave, you want to answer that? Dave, you're on mute. Yep. I am. Thank you very much. And Steve, I think we had a COVID question thrown in there too. But um, yes, Fulton County does have quite a bit of design build experience with our staff. Uh, we did a very new large membrane plant uh, about 15 years ago called the Johns Creek Environmental Campus, which was really our first uh, foray into membranes. And that was design build. And uh, so 
we've been very fortunate. Coming from the transportation side, I did not have any design build experience. So when I came to Fulton County about five years ago, I kind of got thrown into it pretty quickly. We did, even though we had the experience, we did hire a uh, local firm here to help us with the progressive design build process behind the scenes. A lot of the procurement activities, uh, the documents that we needed to get ready for the uh, various teams to, to bid from uh, all came from a, a, someone who had quite a bit of design build experience who kind of helped us along the way. Um, you know, the advice I could give other owners when it comes to, to, to that, um, it's good to start with a smaller project. Um, I, I think personally, pump stations are a perfect design build project. It's fairly well contained at a single location. Uh, that allows you to make uh, kind of the baby steps that you need to make. I don't think uh, linear systems are very good on the design build uh, side of things. We're doing a force main right now that's design build and it's not going nearly as well as our pump stations and how the Big Creek project is going. And primarily because when you're dealing with linear systems, there's so much more right away uh, acquisition hurdles to overcome with v variety of pro uh, properties that you really lose uh, a lot of the efficiencies uh, that you normally achieve in the design build uh, side of things. So there, there's some some thoughts for you, uh, for Lindsay, uh, but I'll be more than happy to talk to you offline about any more specific questions you might have. Yeah, and something that David and I spoke about last night that I had forgotten about. Um, he, he just now mentioned the Johns Creek project, which was, in fact, um, I think there were 30 awards to that project, uh, fascinating Greenfield project that you can read about. And the one the team's most proud of, this is predates both David and my involved in Fulton County, but the team has told me they're most proud of the uh, uh, top award that the DBIA gives out every year, project of the year. Johns Creek project won that. And it was a fixed price design build. And even with all those accolades and pride that came out of the project, uh, the project team uh, was not completely fulfilled with how the project uh, was executed. And there was, there was some friction and, and uh, uh, you know, nothing more than, than usual, but uh, just some some concern that maybe there was a better way. And so what David and I were talking about last night, he reminded me that he, his team actually went out and did a, a market sounding uh, three and a half, four years ago, uh, invited um, various pr practitioners in to visit with, uh, with him and his team and, and kind of get up to date with best practices. The Johns Creek project was like, like you say, David, 10 plus years or so ago and uh, weighed the options uh, and I can't remember if you had an owner advisor to help or not. I know you had an owner advisor come in and help with procurement, but settled on the progressive design build delivery method as, as a way to enhance the delivery model. And sounds like so far it's viewed to be a, a good decision for this project, for this, this client. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Rob Baccaro's question because it's always a a good one, uh, and um, maybe Pavel can take a crack at it first, and, and uh, Kelly, if you want to add to it, which is regarding contingencies, are they controlled by the owner or the contractor? Mm -hmm. That was a very, um, uh, as it often is, a, a very important and extensive conversation as the team negotiated the guaranteed maximum price for construction, and in fact, uh, as you might expect, the, the guaranteed maximum price negotiations were not uh, simple. Um, again, they were co during the COVID time. And David, I don't know what we have at least half a dozen, if not creeping up on a dozen different conversations and negotiations over the course of uh, end of March, April. I guess we wrapped up in May. And uh, the way contingencies were dealt with at the end of the day were actually, I think you might agree, is the linchpin of, of how that uh, GMP finally got uh, closed, that the uh, allocation of risk ended up 
being in the party as best able to control the risk by mutual agreement. And the contingency bucket was actually uh, spread around a little bit between the owner and the design builder to uh, take care of everybody's interests as it related to contingency. So, Pavel, I kind of stole your thunder a little bit, but if you want to go a little deeper on uh, how the contingency uh, equation, if you want to say it that way, was was resolved, um, I'll let you have at it for a little bit. We're getting tight on time, but give it a minute or two and we'll, we'll ask one more question. Sure. Um, I'll summarize by saying that uh, there are a few more, a few buckets of contingencies. One is uh, controlled by the uh, contractor or uh, design builder. Uh, second bucket is uh, the contingency that uh, design builder can tap into with the client's approval. And the third bucket is a contingency that belongs to the client. Uh, and uh, the most important part uh, to note here is each one of those contingency buckets is underwritten by a specific risk items for which that contingency can actually uh, account for. Um, under that concept where you have a clear definition which uh, type of costs would come out of what kind of uh, what contingency bucket, it is very easy to manage the project and it is a very clear line of who owns what and who controls what. And it's also based, as I mentioned previously, on the risk register that clearly defines uh, uh, which co type of costs or potential costs would come out of what kind of buckets. So three buckets, contractor controlled, uh, the contingency that a contractor can tap into by, with the client's approval and the uh, client's contingency bucket. And uh, it's, it's a real science that was looked at, uh, the risk register was looked at uh, by uh, uh, the client and an agreement was made what goes where, what values would be allocated towards that based on the risk profile. David? Yeah, no, and but that, yeah. that's, that's exactly what I was going to say. It worked so well because of Archer Western's willingness to share with the risk register. Because from there, we were able to go line by line. And this Pavel, correct me if I'm wrong, I think there was like 100 different line items on there that we collectively moved things from one bucket to the other throughout the negotiations. Uh, so without having that kind of direction uh, to be able to keep everybody on task, it would have been a much more harder, uh, I think, accomplishment to get through. Uh, so we did wind up with a number of things in the owner contingency side. Uh, it's been more on the contractor side, but because of the negotiations, we moved, we accepted the risk. Uh, but there was a number of other things that the contractor kept. So um, to answer the question, yes, they're both controlled. Um, some are by the owner and some are by the contractor. Uh, but that um, working relationship that was developed very early on in the project, I think allowed for us to have that comfort level to share that risk register between the two of us and come up with a uh, solution that worked for the project. Yeah, and I, I was impressed. Of, uh, the team was very enlightened uh, on that subject, David. Uh, sometimes we forget that, that uh, risk translates to cost. There's no such thing as a free lunch, right? And uh, you, you move risk to a a teammate, it's, it's going to be, has to be accommodated in somebody's budget. And if risk moves to the contractor, the GMP goes up. And if it's realized, he's got it covered. If risk moves to the owner, he's got it covered in the business, in the bit, in the budget. And if if it's not realized, then he gets to keep that that budget. So uh, we had good detailed conversations about that. Um, you know, talk to us in three years. We'll see if it worked <laughs> out. But it feels like, like we're in a good spot at the moment. Okay. Um, David, do you have a time for more questions or do you have to get off to the next uh, brush fire? Nope, I, I got a, a couple more minutes. Okay, uh, I, well, saw, I saw Rob talked about the, the wet weather flows that we're having um, at uh, Big Creek. And Rob, unlike other systems, our system is perfectly tight and perfect, so we don't have any wet flows. <laughs> Um, but no, seriously, I mean, we get about 55 million gallons a day through that plant uh, during wet weather uh, cases. So that's almost two and a half times of what the, the 
plan is designed and permitted for. So obviously we stick water in every nook and cranny uh, on that plant in the in the collection system leading into the plant through the pump stations, wet wells, wherever we can. Um, we're very fortunate that we have a great operator who can treat much greater than 24 million gallons a day uh, when necessary. Uh, so we've been fortunate that we've been able to keep the plant in compliance, albeit uh, we may be out of compliance on a water volume standpoint, but from a water quality standpoint, we've been meeting all of our permits. Uh, Aside from this project, we have a very extensive I and I program that's in place uh, on the system leading into this that we're actually seeing quite a bit of uh, benefit from over the last year uh, with the number of rain events that we've had here in the Atlanta region. So we're making progress on that. Um, that's why I really wanted the EQ tanks to be part of the design and, and Kelly and his staff were able to accommodate us because we need uh, as much uh, wet weather flows as possible. And then also as part of the design of the plan, and Kelly could maybe quickly touch base on this, we actually spent quite a bit of time talking about what the peak through the plant design was going to be. And I think we're in the 70s or, or, or low 80s altogether, right Kelly? Yeah, 76 MGD can go through the membranes, but we've designed uh, the headworks through the primaries all to handle 85 MGD um, to be able to bring flow in and, and put it into the equalization process. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other question that Catherine asked about how did COVID uh, impact this? You know, outside of the fact of all of us getting comfortable to do a lot more things on, on video calls that I don't think none of us were really overly comfortable with initially, I personally like meeting face to face uh, whenever possible. And I think all of the the workshops that we talked about as part of phase 1A was so successful because they were face to face events. Um, but I have to give Archer Western credit, they have a very strong COVID uh, prevention program that they have on, on site uh, and they've been able to uh, really keep all of their workers safe uh, throughout the entire process. So I don't know, Paul, if you wanted to touch base a little bit on what you're um, are doing on site to keep COVID at bay. <clears throat> sure, David. Uh, obviously, we try to make sure that uh, uh, some of the major exposure points are addressed and uh, that be either weekly uh, safety meetings where people are spread out and we would try to make sure that uh, it's being done more in groups rather than uh, in a big gathering. Uh, at the same time, we provided all the PPE, face masks, uh, shields, and glasses, and we tried to make sure that we'll limit the uh, crew sizes. We are fortunate uh, that we approach the uh, uh, the way we construct things is uh, our crews are limited to three, four people, and uh, we just made sure that uh, crew sizes are not growing past those numbers. We keep track of the people actually. Those crews, we try not to you know, change them. Uh, we provided hand wash stations. Uh, but at the same time, uh, when there is an exposure, people would, uh, would get sent home uh, to get tested uh, to make sure that. Uh, uh, concerns uh, to other team members or exposures of the other team members are limited. Uh, we would actually, if we had an instance of where one of our subcontractors tested positive, we made sure that uh, all of the contacts have been traced, identified, and uh, uh, people are notified so they can get tested. The, the obviously person did not return to the project site until he got uh, well. Um, and the, in summary, while well, it does, uh, pre present its own challenges. Uh, it also allows us for an opportunity to have a more personal approach to the people that work for us, the people we work with, trying to address their needs and have those discussions with them. So yes, uh, I like to say that no uh, uh, bad comes without some, without some good. And in this specific case, while it did create some challenges. It provided us with opportunities to, to connect with people that work for us and uh, become more personal. That's a great observation, uh, Pavel. And what we have found trying to uh, keep our work on track, and we've had uh, dozens of people deployed on this project from a design standpoint through the peak of the last number of months and uh, working to uh, accommodate people's uh, new situation home. We've invested in 
ergonomic furniture at home, and we've made sure we've got the collaboration technology, and the information going back and forth between Kelly's team and Paul's team is facilitated with uh, some great software products. And like you say, you don't have the design review workshops perhaps like we used to, but we can do them virtually. And uh, uh, there's, there seems to be an extra effort to get to know each other, uh, like you say, through the virtual meetings as opposed to face-to-face. Uh, -to -face. So remarkably, the uh, project remains on track, even though there's thousands and thousands and thousands of work hours going into the effort uh, remotely. And I think uh, the, uh, commit, the project first commitment that comes with a design build team and the, the good fortune that we had of building that team before the pandemic uh, broke out was, was key. Kelly, anything you wanted to add on the, on the work process side or other side of, of the COVID pandemic impact on, on the project? No, I mean, it's, it's, uh, everybody's taking it seriously and, and putting, uh, preventative measures in place. And, um, you know, I, I think just, just seeing how the work is executed on site is, is, um, is really positive that, um, that things are going to keep moving forward as they, as they are, um, even if the conditions don't change with the pandemic. Uh, David, do you have any final comments before I wrap it up? No, I do not, Steve. Well, I wanted to thank David and Pavel and Kelly for putting this presentation together and giving a good a good uh, talk today. And more importantly, appreciate everybody's time that, that, that joined us. 